All right. Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. This week, it's my turn, and I picked a story in The New Yorker called White Noise by Emma Klein. This came out June 1st of this year. I picked it because she has a new short story collection coming out. I think it's out now. And in reading about that, I found out that she was like one of the youngest writers with like the biggest, most ridiculous book deals, like this advance of something insane, like million, like a million dollars or something. I don't know. I shared it in our workshop and in our newsletter because I was so blown away by this. And then of course, anyone with that kind of like popularity, right, is going to have some kind of scandal. And so she ended up uh, getting sued by her ex for plagiarism and um he insisted that like a lot of her stuff was lifted so i'm reading i'm like hate reading all about this woman right i'm like who is this lady that gets all this money and has all this success oh she's a plagiarist and then like of course the lawsuits dropped blah 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 well the judge dismissed it so it's a bunch of crap but anyway this was a short story that came out kind of um at the time that she was generating interest in her newest collection a little frightening, the carpeted stairs, his ankles feeling hollow and frail. He gripped the banister. Better to just take the elevator from now on. One of the reasons Vogel had offered the house up, that cheesy elevator. Downstairs was quiet, the rooms dark, though a few lights were on in the kitchen. He'd assumed no one was awake, but then Gabe stepped out from the pantry. He was fully dressed, face bright and avid. Good morning, Gabe said smoothly, as if this were a normal hour, as if it were only 5 a.m. Harvey supposed that was what Gabe's job entailed, being perpetually unsurprised. Can I get you a little breakfast? Coffee? Coffee, yes. Harvey patted his stomach absently. Breakfast? No, not yet. My juice, the regular. Certainly, the breakfast room is all set up. Let me know if you need anything else. Gabe brought in the coffee, the glass of juice. Grapefruit juice interfered with Harvey's Lipitor. So lately, he was allowed only a splash with seltzer. He missed the full glass, the scathing mouthful that used to start every day. Four newspapers were lined up in a tidy order alongside the placemat. He'd gotten used to blurring his vision a little, preemptively, just to lessen the shock upon him encountering his own face suddenly on the front page, his name swimming above the fold. Seeing the photos had been rough, worse than he'd imagined. You let go of a lot of things, had to get used to shame, but it was hard to totally abandon vanity. Harvey hobbling with the walker, the suit that the lawyers had insisted be slightly ill-fitting, slightly cheap. They wanted to make everyone feel sorry for him, a strange pose to take, at least in public. It was, he supposed, what he used to do easily enough in private. My mother died today, he said, watching the girl's face change. I'm so lonely, just sit with me a minute just lie here with me, patting the hotel bed over and over, gripping a wrist with his face in a mow of sorrow. Come here, he said. Come on, be a nice girl, not a sour one. I gave you a massage. Now you can give me one. It's only fair. Did I say that word right? M-O-U-E? I don't know. Oh my God. Do not edit this out of the podcast. <laughs> you don't know. A pouting it's expression. Moo. Oh my God. It's moo. <laughs> All right. That's weird. Gripping a wrist with his face in a moo of sorrow. I guess I can kind of picture that. The French? <laughs> Something. All right. So if you haven't kind of gleaned this, dear listener, this is a story that she imagined being told about Harvey Weinstein. So she never says Weinstein in there, but she doesn't need to. And this is around the time that he was... I think this might have been published actually after the verdict came down, but there's a Q&A with her, a very short one in The New Yorker about this story, kind of like what made you come up with it. And she mentions having read an actual reported piece talking about how Harvey was spending time before the verdict in someone else's house, kind of like out of town. And she was thinking, what must that be like? Kind of waiting to hear if you're going to go to prison for probably the rest of your life. So that was the premise. But John, I want to hear from you before I launch into this. I wonder if you enjoyed this at all or if you liked it or what you thought. So I was reading it and I was like, okay, this is very long. And <laughs> um, in the first exchange of dialogue when he's on the phone, you know, you start getting a sense of the character that's being depicted. And then suddenly the reporter he's trying to talk to says, Harvey? And um, he's like, I want this to be off the record. I was like, no, I'm not going to have to read about Harvey Weinstein, am I? Weinstein, mm-hmm. whatever his mm-hmm. name is. Please don't make me read this. 
<laughs> yeah. And I pressed on and I was like, I am reading about him, aren't I? Yes. I mean, it was good. It was well written. Obviously, you know, it's quality fiction writing. And um, it definitely depicted a really vivid character. And she said in that interview that she had, didn't care if it was true to life. She just made yes. stuff up. Right. So whatever, whoever this, this character in the story is, isn't actually Harvey Weinstein. And uh, I read it and I, I was, it was engaging and it was good, but I, I, I wasn't taken with it. Yeah, I have a theory as to why. Because first of all, I think this story may or may not have been published at all had it not been someone like Emma Klein promoting a book. It was timely and it was from her. But otherwise, aren't we done with Harvey Weinstein? Like, I'm so done with Harvey Weinstein. The Me Too movement started how long ago? You know, we've been hearing about this jerk and it, and I wanted it to be the end cap and I don't care to sympathize with him. That's not to say I'm not interested in like a story like this, but I wanted it to be factual. I don't think that her premise was bad or anything. I don't think it's ever wrong to like humanize someone or to imagine what it's like to be someone else or any of that. No, I wouldn't fault her at all for, for no. having read this. I think it's a really, really, really good exercise. But I think the reason that I wasn't like you said, kind of taken with it was because I don't think she probably had to do a ton of work to imagine who this guy is because I have read so many words about this man. I've heard leaked phone calls. I've heard from all of his victims and it's not hard to imagine how he talks how he acts how he thinks that he's a narcissist basically you know that like he's feigning this illness or that it's real or you know he's trying to get sympathy votes at the end there like she says she kind of invents the daughter for him the two daughters and just runs with it and to her point I don't care if he has a daughter either because if he did this sounds about right you know he's trying to get them to stay all night because he's lonely but they, they don't really have that relationship i just um it didn't seem like it was that difficult for her i imagine she could have like kind of sat down and just like written it like start to finish almost and like there's obviously some stuff in there that she's doing really well but um i think if any of us was given a celebrity that we know a lot about and given the task of writing a story that she she tells us she read in a reported piece which delivered this premise to her. What is Harvey Weinstein thinking the day before his verdict? Like that's a story just like delivered right up to her. And she invented like, you know, the Don DeLillo as the neighbor and, you know, the exchange with the daughter and all that. But um, otherwise I feel like the strength of this story was Harvey himself and she didn't invent Harvey. Yeah. Think of a celebrity you really know and think about something terrible that happened to that celebrity recently. Like, okay, fucking what's his name? Who just showed his wiener on Zoom? <laughs> Jeffrey T. Tubin. Jeffrey Tubin. You could absolutely right now write a story about Jeffrey Tubin the night before he knows the story is going to be broken, right? Oh, Things yeah. already happened. We already see him and read his opinions everywhere. We know what he looks like and sounds like and how he acts and what people think of him. And it's not as salacious as the Harvey stuff that we know going into this story, but you could absolutely like do this exercise is my point. And someone like me could read it and think like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. That sounds about right. But is it going to be this like, I don't know. I didn't care about Harvey. It doesn't feel necessary. Yeah. And, and it's almost as if you go into this, not with the goal of a satisfying arc for the character, more just like, can I do this? And the answer is yes, you can do it. But like, did I get anything from it? Feels like an exercise. Yeah. Well done. Ex I mean, you know, it's well executed. Well but executed. It's like a school assignment. Like I doubt, I doubt she's proud of this one. Like she is of her other stuff. It could be. Yeah. Like I don't. I don't think you'd put this at the top of your resume. All the dialogue was great, obviously. All like the kind of, you're in his head throughout, right? All of that's done like very, very well. Characterization is uh, brilliant in this. She yeah. did pull that off. She pulled that off really, really well. <laughs> Yeah, and she definitely like comes up with these little things that are going to like kind of set in motion the ending there, right? And I do like the ending. I mean, not to spoil it, but it kind of talks about how he truly in this moment is so desperate that he thinks that the last line is, there was all the time in the world. And we know, and she knew, I think at the time that she wrote this, I mean, we all had a pretty good guess, even if we didn't know then, that this guy was going to go to prison. And he was old, and he was going to die in prison. And there's even mention of Epstein, which I thought was pretty weird. Yeah. 
So I, by the end, I felt like the arc was there, you know? Well, yeah, his kind of, I don't know, manic kind of approach yeah. of that guy who mistakes to be Don DeLillo and he's like, right. we're going to make a movie together. And the neighbor's like, can I call someone to help you? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, how he leading up to that scene is convincing himself that all of these little things that not Don DeLillo is doing are like signs for him. He's like, oh, he wants me to come over and talk to him. He goes to the extent of telling his daughter that he's working with him already, you know? And yeah, yeah, he's he's a little off, but it, yeah, it's he's just desperate. And I think she got right to the idea that like a guy like this has a ton of people around him all the time. He's never alone. Even Gabe is like, oh, are you up <laughs> at 4 a.m.? Like he, he's never alone but all these people none of them are close to him right i mean he's begging the reporter at the end to take his call and even she's like i'm tarvi i don't want to talk to you right now and then he he like threatens her you know basically with this like not so flattering story about her and she's like no that's it like he doesn't even know how to relate to the people that are closest to him right even his daughter is the whole dinner trying to leave i thought this moment it's when um he's gonna get that treatment for his back the doctor says, uh, we've been starting people at 100 for chronic pain like yours. How does that sound? Harvey shrugged. Let's do more. It might be best just to see how you respond at 100. More, Harvey said mildly, and watched the doctor start to respond. More, Harvey said again, smiling a little. More. And the doctor finally gave up, sensing maybe that Harvey could keep this up as long as it took. That moment felt to me like one of those, you learned everything you need to know about him in yeah. that moment. He's just, yeah. I put a big star by it and wrote, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even like the section that I read did a good job of that. Like each each of these little um, characters almost serve as a really good foil for him. Like each character brings out some all you need to know quality about him. Like, yeah, the way he ends up treating Joan, the way he ends up treating Gabe, the way he ends up treating his daughter. And then, yeah, right there, he's like, I'm going to convince this guy to give me exactly what I want because I always get what I want. And then he talk. I think he goes more in depth in that line of thinking when it comes to the nurse. And uh, no, it's his ass- his assistant in in uh, India when she, he was trying to get the mantra out of her. Yes. He's trying to get her to tell him what the guru whispered into her ear. And she's like, I really shouldn't. It says, but here's the thing. They both knew as soon as he asked the question that she would tell him her mantra. It was just a matter of how long it would take, what the moments between his demand and her capitulation would look like. In the end, it would be the same to him as any other moment of triumph. Only the in-between was different, made up of a different sequence of concessions, the particulars of each person. Some people resisted. Some people did not. Some people went still, unmoving. Some people started laughing out of discomfort. He enjoyed it all even those milder victories it was like different flavors of ice cream and ultimately he was always sated the other person breathing hard squinting shifting some new shame in her face so obviously we know we're not talking about getting girls to tell you their mantra yeah yeah that was like the best paragraph i thought and harvey's story is unique compared to like epstein's story or cosby's story because he wasn't drugging these women and they weren't underage and he says that he's like these were all adults like why am i in trouble i asked them to do things for me and they did it and so to hear him to hear this character explain like how he gets off on convincing girls to do it is interesting because it supports this idea that he really does think that all it takes is convincing people but at some point, Harvey, that's right. That's right. Rape, Harvey. <laughs> but his other daughter wrote to him, right? She wrote to him the email that was just said rape and then uh, CC'd her yes. shrink. Yeah, that was good. But it's a good, that's good on Emma Klein to explore, like, what about a person that does this kind of thing, what they enjoy about doing it, right? We all know that, like, Epstein, Cosby, Harvey, they all work very differently. The end goal was the same for everyone. But they didn't all necessarily, like, get off on the same encounter, right? So it's interesting to kind of hone in and say, like, oh, this is a guy that really enjoys making people do things for him. And that's, that's I think, enough of a seed that we see throughout this whole story. He's doing it when his daughter is trying to leave. And he's like, no, 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 don't leave. What about dessert? And she's like, I'm not really hungry. And and so he tries to get his granddaughter to eat dessert, you know? And like, he succeeds and they stay longer. They don't stay all night as long as he wants, but like, he probably enjoyed that power struggle as well, you know? And we know that from the reporting, right? That all these women were promised and more or less roles or stardom. And I don't think it humanizes him, but I do like to know the motivation. I hate when people who read these kind of stories are really disgusted just want to like dismiss people like Harvey as monsters because then we ignore how they're successful. It's like calling Ted Bundy a monster. He wasn't a monster. He was charming. 
it's dangerous. Like, I think it's worth like investigating, you know, just like examining how these people are successful. Yeah. And that is the power of fiction. You know, what she does in the story with the point of view. One of the things I was thinking about in this story is the representation of internal thoughts in fiction is like something that the modernists really concern themselves with. Like James Joyce doing stream of consciousness and uh, Virginia Woolf did it a different way. Just everybody tried to just that kind of conscious experience put on the paper and I think you could took a look at this story even like the first few paragraphs and just follow how she's presenting his stream of thoughts in, right. in those the kind of switch between internal thought you know kind of like what you're thinking in words versus just sensory impressions versus actions done in the world it's really interesting but that's doing that in fiction is what allows us to kind of get close to somebody and understand them as not like you said not merely a monster but something else right. that we can dissect and examine what is the kind of mind that does these things. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you wouldn't in any kind of a fiction story say he was a monster, period. That's it, right? That's not that's, that's the, whole not story. the point. Yeah, you gotta like we gotta know why. But to your point about like how she's really good about the stream of consciousness, it's like every scene, even like if you if you look at any like uh the start of any of these sections, like this one, just a random one I pulled up, it says lunch in the dining room, Gabe pouring ice from a carafe, a square of black cod the size and thickness of a pack of cards, charred broccolini, a scoop of and white rice left with parsley he still felt dazed his thoughts dropping a little bit behind he wasn't hungry a few half-hearted forkfuls of rice he felt different from the person he had been that morning like he'd stepped off to the side of himself i mean she's describing lunch there at the beginning but it still feels like we're in his head right like he's looking at lunch it's not a narrator it's it's harvey throughout and she's not just saying like what he's thinking but like what he's feeling and usually um like he's feeling dazed he's not hungry like those usually are these like little things that i don't care too much about it's like when a writer writes first person or stream of consciousness the first time they don't know what's important and what's not and here in this story it's all important right because this is the, his last real day and he's just trying to like count down the hours so she does a, you're right she does a really good job of keeping us really, really close to him. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's a tricky thing because we as readers have to somehow become aware that this person he believes to be Don DeLillo is not Don DeLillo. And right. yet without the character realizing it, you know, I'm always fascinated by that because, you know, there's so many times in fiction where you, if you want to adhere to your point of view, you know, to your your character, you need to communicate something to your readers that your character doesn't see. Right. But the only way to do that is through the character's eyes and through their thoughts and through what they're experiencing. A really clumsy way is to break it and say, little did he know... <laughs> You know, right. that wasn't Don DeLillo. Right. But that breaks the, the whole experience of the story. That breaks the um, the point of view. Well, how did you know that it was not Don? I suspected at a certain point, but I didn't know until the ending when he's like, can I call somebody? Right. That was when it was confirmed to me. That is a good, I should, I should have, uh, I read this twice and I should have paid attention in the second reading to when that happened, but I didn't. Right. Because it's like, he says, uh, they go outside and like he interrupts and it's fun. Um, Harvey interrupts this neighbor in, in, a, in the middle of a phone call he's having. And he's like, right. we both needed some air. He's like trying to create this connection between them, like inventing this connection. The guys, and so his fingers were freezing, almost numb, but his back didn't hurt, not at all. His nose was runny, but he didn't make to wipe it. He tasted salt in his smile. Don't worry, Harvey said, almost whispering. I'm not going to make a scene or turn this into a big deal. I just, he said, want you to know it's an honor to meet you. Don DeLillo looked bewildered. Do you you want me to call someone? Don DeLillo said. This is literally the second to last paragraph. And that's when I knew for sure it wasn't him. Yeah. Well, I'm not very bright. And I had to read like her interview where she's like, yeah, it's not Don DeLillo. And, and I was like, right, it's not Don DeLillo. But I think what was achieved either way, even if it was Don DeLillo, all we need to know is that Harvey is on a different planet when he's talking about reading signs from this guy, having any kind of imminent project. He doesn't even know the opening line of the guy's book, right? Like she achieves still without saying, like you said, 
said directly that this is not Don and breaking the point of view that this is not the Don he thinks it is, right? He's wrong about this guy in a million ways, even if it's not his identity. And yeah, there's like a huge disconnect. I got still that he was frantic either way. So yeah, he's just off his rocker at the end. He's just desperate, which I remember thinking that seeing him like going to court on his little walker. I'm like, this is a guy that is either like that wrecked by this or this is like a a Hail Mary plea for sympathy. I guess here's my other point. Here's my other criticism. <laughs> if we were all if we were all given this assignment, imagine Harvey Weinstein's last day before his testimony, he's staying at this house. And then if we were also given the plot points that she comes up with, maybe just one of them, like any begs his daughter to come over for dinner. I don't think it would be, I think if 50 of us did this, I guarantee you 25 of us would have a Gabe character. There's not a whole lot of leaps you have to make to assume that this guy's not alone. I don't know. My point is, I don't know how much of this is Emma Klein and how much of this is the terrific story that Harvey is, right? I mean, there's going to be a movie about Harvey. I think there already is or something. Yeah. And he's he's already, uh, he's f- fully developed. There's not much else we can explore about this man, right? As with every sex abuse story, we also have graphic descriptions of what he looks like naked. So like, what else is there to know? So I always always wonder with stuff like this, especially when um, a, an author writes a timely piece like this, but doesn't name it after the person that you suspect it's about. It's like, how much of this is your own? Anyway, I think it was a little long too. Could probably trim it. Yeah. But the New Yorker long. loves long stuff. Like how long is her reading of it here? Like an hour. Is it really? I considered letting her read it to me and I was like, an hour? No hour? way. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, now I know enough about Emma Klein, though. Like, my whole point, like I said, was to kind of, like, read this to see what she was all about. And, like, I definitely still want to read her stuff. She's definitely, I mean, she's a great writer. Yeah. Just the story, I was like, meh, how much of it was her? So, John, do you have a takeaway for this one? Yeah, my takeaway is that if you get anything in The New Yorker, they're going to stick that diaresis into your words. You know, if you don't (laughs) want it to be there. Yeah, exactly. They're weird little stylistic choice that they're just clinging to. Mm -hmm. Some 19th century publication. I don't get it. Yeah, they love it. I don't know. I guess my takeaway on this is basically his point of view again. It's just how to how to get really close third stream of consciousness. It's not quite stream of consciousness all the time, but just really close third person. This is a good study of that. Yeah. Everything is through his lens, right? He doesn't get off track describing like what the house looks like without his impressions of it or any any of that stuff, right? We hear about the elevator because he's thinking about how weird and cute it is. Yeah. That's like something small, but it all adds up to the overall effect. I guess my takeaway, I've kind of said this before for The New Yorker, but they love like a timely story like this. <laughs> and if you can tie it, I guess, to something that's top of mind for people, whether whether or not you're like inventing um, plot for a character like Harvey, that's actually Harvey. But we talked about it with, like I said, the last podcast, The Feminist or whatever, we talked about gender studies in The New Yorker and how that was like around Trump's election. And The New Yorker eats that stuff up. But I, I don't think it's just... A takeaway for how to get published in the New Yorker. I think it's more a takeaway of like, if you're stuck, I mean, what's going on around you? If you're if you're someone like me, you're paying attention to this kind of stuff already. So it's not a hard leap to think like, what kind of a story can I write based on what's happening in the world? Man, I do not want to read a hundred stories about living through a pandemic. Uh, no one does, John. And yet, <laughs> you're going to see so many of them. Nobody cares. Yeah, it's it's almost like the more universal um, an experience is, the less I care. Yeah, we are all doing it. You don't have to write those stories. We no. know. We know. Yeah, that's like, I don't know. It's kind of like why people didn't like uh, girls with uh, <laughs> Lena Dunham. It's like, yeah, we get it. We're all millennials right now that are broke. This is cute, I guess. So yeah, but if there is something like going on around you, I don't know that you've, I guess I'm saying like, and I do this anyway, current events are fodder, of course. Yeah. But there are some people that just never use that. I don't know. I use it occasionally. Maybe I'll start using it more. Maybe the New Yorker will, men- will notice me. That's right. All right. Well, thanks guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to our monthly newsletter at our website, NaplesWritersWorkshop.com. And for daily writing tips, industry news, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop.